treaty as contract, treaty as statute, treaty as executive act, treaty as nothing at all. And I thought that at least this, that title would draw a full house. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but we have a very interested, uh, if small, audience who will have a great deal of opportunity to question him after his presentation. So please welcome to the podium with applause, Professor Linsky. No applause necessary. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And thanks for, for doing such a great job of running the Humanity Center Brown Bag uh, and encouraging us at the law school to come across the courtyard and uh, float our ideas to other people in the, uh, in the university. Uh, the, the good news I wanted to state at the app front is the, the chapter that I'm working on now with the title you gave is part of a, a larger book um, with an, uh, one co-author from the uh, political science department, Brad Roth, cool. and another uh, co-author, uh, uh, Fox, uh, from the law school. So it's kind of in the spirit of the Humanities Center uh, in um, uh, working across disciplines and, and with others. Um, so um, after um, uh, ha having said that, um, what I'm presenting here is a work in progress. It's just one uh, chapter of that book. Um, that book, with the title that was given, so you get a sense of the whole uh, project, is meant to look at how uh, huge the change is in the last 30 years in the way Americans regard treaties. Um, how, uh, uh, what process we use to, go to get into them, how we interpret them, what bite they have within the US legal system. And the thesis of that book is, We've been at treaties for a very long time in this country, well over 200 years. And it is remarkable the extent to which you can really map out how much things have changed in the last couple of decades. And this is an effort on our part to explain why that's so, whether that's a welcome development or an unwelcome development, and what we ought to do. So in that spirit, uh, my chapter has a descriptive part and a, a normative part. OK, and maybe the best way for me to uh, introduce it is, is, is uh, is uh, to say two things. First is, um, this chapter in this piece is part of, uh, I guess, uh, my larger body of work. Much of what I really interests me and what I write about is um, the relationship between the international legal system, international norms, uh, our efforts on the globe to uh, control violence, to um, uh, uh, pollution in the air, many, many global problems and um, our domestic legal system, uh, much of which has evolved to uh, combat or deal with similar problems, but on a smaller scale. And the thesis of earlier works I've written has been that Americans typically approach the international legal system as if it were an extension of their own domestic legal system. Um, uh, that's partly a product of history. It's partly a product of familiarity. It's partly a product of power and chauvinism. And sometimes it works, often, in my humble view, uh, focusing mostly on litigation, often it doesn't work. Uh, often we are taken in by our own metaphors and analogies, and we apply them in a misplaced way, and pathologies develop. Uh, I did that an extensive study of, on that uh, with respect to uh, how we handle domestic litigation, and the problems of domestic litigation, and transnational uh, court litigation. This study is uh, similarly about treaties. And what is it the, about the way we handle treaties that actually doesn't fully acknowledge their source, their international character, and treats them in some ways as an extension of our own domestic law? And what are the, what I would argue, unfortunate results of that? So uh, that said, let me uh, give a nice preview as to my uh, my uh, title for the chapter. And I very much welcome, by the way. Um, sometime in, uh, toward the, whenever you can in the talk, what you really think of the title, uh, whether it's off-putting or whether it's intriguing. So, um, treaty as contract, treaty as statute, treaty as executive act, treaty as nothing at all. Um, I meant it as a progression, uh, and that is, as, as you'll see as I develop the talk, is uh, Americans have for a long time been comparing treaties to other legal documents of which they're more familiar. The traditional one being the treaty as being a kind of contract. And more recently, treating treaties as uh, some sort of more similar to statutes or more similar to administrative regulations. And uh, I guess my thesis 
about all of that is the ultimate, in some ways, uh, I say sort of sarcastically, the ultimate end of that is uh, each time we make that move, the treaty seems to mean less and less within our domestic legal system. And so the trajectory seems to be at some point uh, treaties have no legal bite at all, or only whatever bite we choose to give it. And so a treaty is nothing at all. Um, okay. So as I promised, I'm going to divide the talk into these two parts. The first is the descriptive part. And what I want to do in my descriptive part as I go through to you is um, explain to you, hopefully convince you, of one really major point, which is there's something really odd about treaties. Um, and that is, you know, when domestic courts or parties in the, in the, in the American legal system have a contract dispute, and uh, try to pitch this at both levels. I mean, for those of you who are non-lawyers, you know, a contract is an agreement, written agreement between private parties, usually non-governmental parties. And if something goes wrong in that contractual relationship, there are different ways to try to remedy the problem. But one ultimate resource is to go to court. And what a court will typically have to do, one part of it is, will have to interpret this document. What does it require? Did your behavior? meet the requirements of the contract, or did it in fact constitute a breach? And if it constituted a breach, was there some sort of uh, excuse for that? Uh, is there some sort of remedy, uh, and so forth? And the, um, the uh, simple, you know, the, uh, the remarkable answer, uh, well, at least with contracts, as you follow from the you know, late 1700s until the present is, when Americans look at contracts, American courts or other officials, they don't compare it to anything else. A contract is a contract, and they're very familiar with what it is. And there's no importing of other kinds of interpretation on the whole. I mean, we can leave uh, to the side uh, movements in the 1970s and 1980s to interpret or to inject various forms of literary interpretation or other things like that, because they are, on the, on the whole, in the American legal system, marginal. Okay. Um, American courts know what contracts are, and they've developed a, an extensive body of contract law filled with default rules, presumptions, all sorts of things meant uh, to guide that. And the same thing is true uh, in a different form with statutes. Americans have been interpreting statutes for a less long period of time and less extensively. But when you look at American courts and legislatures and administrative agencies and everyone who from time to time has to interpret a statute, you know, what does the Affordable Care Act say, and, uh, you know, do you qualify under this provision or that provision? Somebody's going to have to do those things. Typically, all the relevant actors will draw upon a body of what we call statutory interpretation. And although statutory interpretation is not really a very completely stable body of law in the United States in that uh, different courts will have different opinions about it, you won't run across a court um, wandering to say, well, what would we do if it were a treaty? Let's, let's in, uh, import treaty interpretation law. No. On the whole, they know what statutes are, they know what their duty is, and they will uh, uh, pursue a body of law called uh, um, statutory interpretation. And finally, um, administrative agencies, the executive branch, um, corporations, um, and um, courts uh, have to interpret administrative regulations. And these are detailed legal instruments that an executive branch body um, will enact pursuant to a statute. And they'll typically be more detailed than that statute. And there are sometimes different presumptions that, that accompany it, it, interpreting an administrative regulation and a statute, things like agency expertise, uh, various things like that. But the one major first main point I wanted to make about this, which I find is kind of remarkable uh, to me. I, I, I had read treaties for so long, and I'd read uh, cases for so long interpreting treaties before I really pondered over it and thought over it, which is from the beginning of the Republic, in fact, before the beginning of the Republic, up until the present time, when Americans interpret treaties, it's very often that they will use some sort of analogy. Okay, so the main paper itself has uh, starts with extensive, in very important cases, and court cases involving different types of treaties, and um, 
uh, some bilateral, some not bilateral, different areas of law in which courts will roll out a very common statement. A treaty is a contract among nations. You'll find John Marshall says that early in the Republic. You'll find lots of courts repeat it. And what they, mean, what they seem to mean by that is treaties are contractual in nature. Could, could I ask for yes. information? Oh, please, please. Uh, does that apply to UN agreements in which nations sign an agreement like how the con what are the limits of the conduct of war or the safeguarding of civilians or what are human rights? Are those included in what you're calling treaties or as interpreted by Americans as contracts? Uh, it's a really good question. I'm going to actually, uh, maybe I ought to repeat it because I'm not sure I got all the ways to the other side of the table. I think your question was, are you talking about, I guess what you'd say, multilateral uh, type uh, treaties in which there are more than one country involved and often under the auspices of some sort of international organization, whether it be the United Nations or the, the Law of the Sea Convention or you know, very, various uh, bodies. And the answer is uh, yes, they're both treaties uh, of a kind. Um, it's a good question to ask because uh, early on in the, in the history of the uh, country, most of our treaties were bilateral. And some would say uh, that's a really good uh, anchor for the contractual view of treaties because a bilateral treaties has a lot of at least superficial similarities with contracts. There are two parties. Um, they can be viewed as a zero-sum game in a certain sort of way, what one gives up, the other has to, so forth. And because, um, uh, you know, for that reason, um, but as, as, as you'll see all develop, uh, American courts at least have been using the cont contract of, uh, analogy for a long time, even with respect to treaties that are not bilateral, even with respect to treaties that are multilateral. That are what? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Even with respect to treaties that are multilateral. Oh. Now, now, of course, to be fair, uh, contracts can be, private law contracts can be multilateral too. Um, that is, um, you know, some contractual arrangements have insurers, lenders, you know, so on and so forth. But typically when you're at the stage, at least when you're in court, there's usually, it's often a bilateral configuration of parties, okay? Um, all right, so from the, so uh, the first point I put on the, on the table was um, for a vast expanse of American legal history, Americans have with respect, if you talk about the main legal documents that law students in this university get familiar with, hopefully by the end, they are the Constitution, statutes, uh, contracts, administrative regulations, and hopefully treaties, leaving aside things like wills and so on and so forth. And what you find is there's this one type of document, treaties, that is constantly interpreted or used as if it were analogized to something else, right? So, my next point, okay, having uh, observed that oddity, what turns on this? Okay, that's kind of an interesting sort of observation, but does it really matter? And I guess my next point is it does. Uh, okay, it does, because um, metaphors in general matter and the law is filled with analogies and metaphors. Okay, so we're, we're familiar with the most obvious of them, the scales of justice, um, the sports analogies, the end zone, all of those things. They, why, do, why does anybody use a metaphor or analogy in uh, any situation? Well, I guess the first reason is because you compare A to B because B is more familiar than A, and in some ways that will make your point more clearly. Um, and then the second major reason is because lawyers are strategic. And no metaphor is perfect, but I, I advance a metaphor or analogy in part because it will persuade you better than this. Okay, so uh, what turns on this in the case of, uh, uh, of treaties? Well, the progression I've noted, okay, from treaty as contract to treaty as statute to treaty as administrative regulation, what follows from that is different presumptions, different default rules, 
a different way of confronting the outside world that uh, flows from that. So let, let's go back to uh, what is uh, the central canons of American contract interpretation, many of which were in, imported into uh, treaty interpretation, and what kind of um, posture that placed the United States vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world for a long period of time. Well, when I think of contract interpretation, and I taught contracts actually for about five years, um, what is the role of the judge in adjudicating private contract disputes? Well, I think the classic role of the judge, uh, sort of the Lon Fuller articulated role of the judge in private law adjudication is, um, the judge is neutral arbiter. The judge is entirely neutral, has no interest in the litigation one way or another. <clears throat> And the, and the judge in a contract dispute needs to fulfill that role <clears throat> even if the state of the Michigan is actually party to the dispute and you're a Michigan state judge or the United States is party to the dispute and you're a federal judge. Okay, So that is the role of, of, the, uh, of the judge. The second important thing about contract litigation and interpretation is for the most part there's no deference to any other political branch because what is the heart of most contract litigation? It's a document, a contract, and actually a court is as good at reading that document as anyone, some would arguably say better, and fact-finding. And courts in the judicial process, in the context of a contract dispute, are expert at fact-finding. So you'll be hard-pressed to see many private law adjudication contracts in which a judge will show any sort of deference to any other political body in the mode of contract adjudication. Third, at the heart of contract adjudication is textualism. Go to the contract itself first. Go outside the contract only if you have to. And if you have to, if you absolutely have to, and you typically only have to under most rules of American uh, state contract law is, only if there's some ambiguity created by the text itself, or if what happened, what transpired, seems to be outside of what the text was dealing with. And if, it, if, if the neutral judge needs to approach that and do so, what will the judge do? Um, the judge will look for the mutual intent of the parties, with the emphasis being on the word mutual. Right? So a judge in that role, in a contract role, is not to look at what one party wanted out of this contractual arrangement exclusively, so for instance, evidence, rules of evidence in civil litigation say that if one party wanted goals A, B, and C very strongly, but never communicated that to the other party, it's inadmissible. You can't interpret a contract that way because you're looking for the mutual intent of the party, and something can only be mutual if it's shared. Last, contract interpretation. Uh, there are instances in, pri in private uh, law contracts, for instance, in which there are two authentic versions of a contract in different languages. And I've been involved in transactions which have done that as well, in which both are equally authentic because neither one wants to be tied to an English language text and so forth. And the role of the judge in private law contract adjudication, if the parties designated both agreements as authentic is to treat them as equally authentic, to consult both language versions if there's a language, if there's a particular word that's in dispute, uh, and so forth. So what does all of this mean for much of, before I get on to statutory interpretation and so forth, what does all of this mean in what I would call uh, this golden era in which um, American courts in particular uh, import a vast volume, vast amounts of of a, of a large volume of contract interpretation literature. It meant, for the most part, a great deal of even-handedness when there was a dispute and that contract and that treaty was resolved in the U.S. court. And the contract rules that drove that even-handedness was resort to the mutual intent of the parties, focused on the text and only go outside the text if you have to, pay attention to both or more than one language of these parties. And then the strongest indication of this to me is this. 
you read, especially early 1800, treaty interpretation contracts, uh, uh, decisions from the lower federal courts to the U.S. Supreme Court, and what really jumps out at you is that the judges are viewing themselves or they want you to believe that they're viewing themselves as neutral arbiters. They are interpreting a document in the context in which how that interpretation goes, one way or the other, will have a bearing on the, on the United States as a whole, not only on the parties. And it would have been possible to regard, you know, after all, a court, uh, you know, federal court is part of the federal government of the United States, which has a stake in this. But it's very clear from their rhetoric, and I believe sincerely felt, that judges view themselves as different than the other branches of government in the context of treaty disputes. And why they did so is because it comes from the founding. You know, it's very clear from the founding era and the decades following the immediate founding era that if the United States is to survive, it will have to be seen as playing by the rules. It will have to avoid instances in which uh, a bad court decision or a mistreating a foreign government or a foreign dignitary will embroil the country in a needless conflict. And if one can't count on the political branches always to, to avoid that, since they face, you know, look at the period after Jay's treaty, they face enormous political pressure at times to give offense to others. Then the courts have to fill that role. Okay, good place to stop. Do we? Uh, could you give some examples of the early days? What type of treaties that ended up in those courts? Uh, well, the first, the, first, the first that came up with kind of regularity and were, uh, just to repeat in case anybody uh, heard, heard it is, uh, when you say the early days, I think um, I'm thinking of the first several decades of the 1800s uh, before we get into the kind of different in the late 1800s. In the early 1800s, among the most common treaties that came up were boundary treaties and peace treaties. Okay, boundary treaties, so for instance, at the end of hostilities, uh, fixing a, uh, a boundary with uh, Florida. These wound up in U.S. courts because, depending on how clear the language of the treaty is, and depending upon the actions of state governments and federal governments, um, you might have a, a situation in which uh, two litigants claim the same land, pursuant to two different sources. One says, uh, that land is mine by the treaty. And the other says, uh, no, that land is uh, that is land, my land by some act of the state legislature. And the treaty, by the way, isn't effective because it was never self-executing, and so it's mine. So, and, so and, and the courts at this period, I'm sorry. In that type of dispute, the, the party is all private. There is no state, right. which would be a, a party to the controversy. Uh, uh, there's no state that's a party <coughs> to the controversy, but you can easily see the spillover effect because if, uh, you know, a, a court in Florida or the, the circuit court interprets the treaty in one particular way. Um, true, that interpretation is only binding on the parties, but it has persuasive effects for the other cases and affects other people and affects the state of Florida potentially. Yes? Uh, is, is it, I, I'm thinking like a, when, I, when you, as you said that, I immediately thought of like when Michigan or whether Ohio declared war on each other, uh -huh. war, and you mean in, where the, would, in the big house? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I believe the the Michigan militia went to uh, Toledo to invade or something like that because they uh -huh. wanted Toledo and they oh, fought they over it. Uh -huh. They couldn't go to the courts, or did they go to the courts, or could they have gone? And with, how would they? Were, were the courts going to be the one to define the borders, or was it the federal government or the Congress? Uh, who decides on that? Well, I, um, um, Is that I'm going to have to complete a lot of ignorance, because when you talk about a dispute over land between Michigan and Ohio, are you talking about sort of after the constitutional period or, or pre-constitutional? I mean, it's not an international law question. Uh, uh, no, well, I, when you use it as sense, the sense of uh, that as a, as, a, as a treaty in the sense that I'm thinking of that the states thought of themselves almost like separate governments, uh -huh. and that they were would make 
they make negotiations with each other. Mm -hmm. That's the sense of it, I think of it as a, when you were talking about it as a contract. Okay, so you're talking about interstate compacts. Well, all I can say to you about that is, under the Constitution, if you're talking about the period after 1789, all interstate comp compacts are regulated by Congress. Okay, and states, in order to conclude agreements among themselves about things like that, need the permission of Congress to do so. So that really takes it out of the realm of treaties and international law or okay. anything like that. And, and you can understand why that really needs to be so. Um, so did you have a kind of? Um, let's see if I can formulate this question. Oh, okay, uh, there, sure. are, there are two points that I'm interested. One is the many treaties, I believe, for example, the International Court of Justice, but other comparable agreements. Uh -huh. Nations, including the United States, can sign statements that say, we take exception to this part. This part does not apply. We agree to the agreement, but this part um, will not apply to us. Uh -huh. um, um, you mean your reservation to a treaty? Yeah. That's what that's called. Uh, but, and, when, and when a party, uh, just a little side into the international law governing uh, treaties, um, Particularly in the case of multilateral treaties, in which 20 countries become parties to a treaty, it is possible through that process for a country, depending on uh, what the treaty provides, to say, uh, we accept the first 19 articles, but we're not going to abide by Article 20. Or we, regard, or we interpret Article 20 this way and not that way. Um, uh, that enters into, um, you're right to point out that that sometimes entered into a uh, the second part of this is sort of outrageous. Uh, here's the way I formulate it. What would you say about the proposition that the change in the way the U.S. interprets treaties uh -huh. is consistent with the transformation of the U.S. from just another actor in the international system to the empire? Um, well, you're, you're uh, sort of very much anticipating where I'm going uh, next, and oh, I, I very much agree me. with that. Um, I, I can't read your mind, so don't worry about it. Sure, just so we, where you know I am, is I'm almost done explaining what turns on uh, the way you interpret it, uh, the, the metaphor and analogy you use. And the next place I go after that is, okay, so why the transformation? What, what was driving that? And then uh, where, where I tend to conclude is, um, what should we do? Do I agree with this or not? and what should be the future of U.S. Uh, treaty interpretation. So thanks for sort of pushing me along there. Were there any other hands to this? Yes. I, I was, as you were thinking, I was, I was immediately thinking of the Federalist Papers. Is there any discussion of treaties in the Federalist Papers? There are. There is. In Federalist 80 and several other parts. And, and uh, that's, where, uh, that's where you see the language from the founding period, which uh, truly elevates treaties. Uh, most of the founding generation and the first generations of courts uh, put treaties very, very high. And that's why, um, just a quick aside, the Constitution has three main references to treaties, all of which seem to place treaties on a very high level. So for instance, the, the treaty creation process for treaties, that is a two-thirds vote in the Senate, is rigorous, much higher than typical uh, legislation. Um, second, the, um, the jurisdictional provisions uh, when, uh, where a treaty dispute can go, the, the founding generation was very clear to provide a pathway to go to federal courts as opposed to state courts, which seemed to help to recognize their importance and the potential mischief of uh, uh, misinterpreting uh, treaties. And, um, supremacy. Oh, yeah, that's right, of course. And in the Supremacy Clause, um, they made very clear that treaties trump all state law. Right? So those three provisions at all are just indicative, and the Federalist Papers uh, go beyond that, of just how reverential and how important the founding generations regarded uh, treaties. Uh, and that is the generation from which the contract metaphor uh, goes. Well, let me just quickly um, finish talking about statutes and administrative regulations and push on where, to where I want to go as far as the normative part of my talk. Um, uh, about in the 1960s and 1970s, you start to see more references to treaties like statutes. And you see 
scholars consciously arguing in some cases that treaties ought to be interpreted more like statutes, and then you see courts adopting this uh, to some degree. And uh, sort of uh, what turns on this as opposed to uh, contracts? Well, um, treaties are fundamentally different, uh, co contracts are fundamentally different, uh, play a fundamentally different role in our legal universe than contracts. I mean, you would say contracts are the fundamental document for private ordering. Okay, the, they embody the, the belief that the society is best served, becomes the most efficient, if private parties write those agreements, and if courts of the states simply enforce them. Okay? The statutory instrument is a much more activist role um, from government, either state government or federal government. Sometimes the statutes play a regulatory role, sometimes they play a role of incentives, but fundamentally, the, the approach of uh, statutory interpretation, which is different than contra contract interpretation, is not only what does the statute say, but what, what did the statute seek to do? What framework is it? What did, where is the public good? What was the legislature trying to accomplish? That is a focus on one body, a coordinate branch of government, as opposed to two private parties, the negotiating parties. And the, and to make reference to what I said before about contract interpretation, what's really key about statutory interpretation, remember I said statutory interpretation with the judge as neutral arbiter involves essentially, <coughs> bless you, involves essentially no um, deference to other branches of government. And statutory interpretation is the opposite. It involves total deference to another branch of government. After all, the role of the court is to implement and to enforce and to bring into being what the legislature intended. First with the text, and then if you look at uh, the explosion of um, legislation that happened in the 1960s through the 1990s before the, first, the current court, you see a lot of looking at, um, as supplements to the text, uh, two things. First, what's the overall framework for regula regulation, how does this statute relate to that statute or to this one, and legislative history. And that is the gross, you, you, you want to have a really fun time some Sunday, you go to the library. And you look at legislative histories from early statutes in the, in the 1800s, and it's like that. Even statutes that are enormously important, like the Sherman Act. And then you look, start to look at legislative histories in the 70s, and they're enormous. Okay. Uh, and they're enormous in part because they're also strategic, because once political actors know that courts will look at legislative history to interpret the statute, there's incentive to put things into legislative history that you couldn't get in the text of the statute. Okay? So what, what, is the, um, what, are the, what are the implications of this for treaty interpretation? Well, if a treaty is like a statute, if a treaty is like a statute, you approach it deferentially, depending on who you're going to defer to. You're looking for regulatory uh, goals okay, of this legislative body rather than the mutual intent of two negotiating parties. And it needn't be this way, but as a practical matter, the more you look at it, who are American courts looking to uh, when they consider a multilateral treaty like a statute? They look at the US negotiators. They look at what the intent of Congress was but it passed the implementing legislation for the statute. Um, they forget about, in many cases, different linguistic versions of the ultimate treaty. They focus on the English ones. Okay, And even more so, if the treaty itself was enacted 30 years ago and the dispute has come up now, well, they'll sometimes drift and not really even look at the legislative intent 30 years ago, but they will sort of allow things to creep forward somehow, which is really what the current political actors want it to be now. In short, once a treaty becomes statute, there's less even-handedness. Uh, there's a good deal of even-handedness, and courts even start to really back away from the contract model and see themselves as, well, the political branches that negotiate treaties, we ought to mostly be trying to pay attention to what they think it was. They had more resources, they were there, and so on and so forth. And this gets carried to, to an even greater extent when it comes to uh, treaties as administrative regulation, 
Uh, what I mean to refer to that is, you know, some treaties like the nuclear non-proliferation or the chemical weapons treaties or various things like this are extremely detailed. After all, you've got to, de you've got to define what chemicals are banned and in what quantities and how they're going to be treated and all of this. These have enormous annexes, and they look a lot like um, federal administrative agency regulations. And the, you know, the, ca the main canon of American administrative law uh, in a case called Chevron is uh, when great expertise is, is required, um, defer to the expertise of the agency, which is much greater than the expertise of the courts. Um, and agency interpretations, so long as that they're plausible and reasonable, tend to be upheld. And so what you see in treaty interpretation cases involving those kinds of ones is, uh, you know, the court will place great emphasis on the, on the testimony or the affidavit of the administrative official or the negotiating party from the, from the U.S. team as to what it meant, uh, and, and so forth. So, uh, that's the progression and that's the descriptive part. Lance? There's sort of another, another variation on this theme. When you have treaties like, like the Human Rights Treaties, mm -hmm. which are, in some sense, setting out fundamental rights and then are meant to be interpreted and developed through additional documentation and also through application in different countries. I mean, how does that fit into the model and, and where, where do those best fit? In in this conception of interpretation? Oh, that's a, that's a really, really good question. So there are the treaties that are meant to be uniform from country to country. Uh, but Lance brings up a very good point. There are some treaties that establish frameworks, and then countries have a fair amount of ability to adapt them to sort of local circumstances uh, and so forth. Um, so where does that uh, you know, fit in all of that? Well, in almost all of those cases, uh, for that treaty to become law in the United States, they will need to be implementing legislation. And the implementing legislation is a statute. And typically what will happen is, uh, in the event of a dispute, a court will focus on the implementing legislation and the statute, and it will be almost pure statute. Now, it, truthfully, what a court should do in this situation is in evaluating implementing legislation, always consider it in relationship to the treaty, um, but often that doesn't take place. Yeah, because, but, but the, the treaties also have their own oversight bodies and methods of sort of review oh. of compliance, and that's... Sure. Yeah. So. Yeah, that brings up the question, um, which is really a separate lecture, which is how do the, how the parties behave since they signed the treaty, and what role should that play in interpretation? That's a very, very good question. Um, allow me to talk to you about that later so okay. I can just get into my, uh, my normative punch and then you guys can attack me. Okay, so, um, so what I've described is this uh, progression and that the progression ultimately leads to um, uh, more, more and more instances in which uh, U.S. courts or U.S. Uh, executive branch acting or interpreting a, a treaty which at least many of our treaty partners don't think was right, really think is a matter of self-interest or error or, or something like that. And in the paper, I give a number of examples of that. So uh, what do I draw from this and what recommendation do I make about American treaty practices and where we go for, first? Okay, so the first, my first point after thinking about this for quite some time is we need to stop the analogies, perhaps. Okay, we've developed a large body of law over a long period of time, and then sometime in the 60s and 70s, those who found the contract analogy either not accurate because many of our treaties are no longer bilateral, or not to our advantage because it locks us into agreements at times when others aren't, um, didn't really approach that head on, but instead changed the analogies and said, well, let's look at it like a statute, or let's look at it like an administrative regulation. And my feeling now is those are probably going to create their own problems at some point because a treaty is none of those. There are, treaties are unique. And here are the things about treaties that are unique that make no uh, analogy uh, perfect. And 
worse than that, sometimes lead us to be kind of go down and be confused by our own analogies. So what's unique about treaties? Well, the most obvious one is there are sovereign parties on both sides. Um, and that is different. Um, that is different in terms of um, escalation, uh, in terms of affecting a broad area of American life, um, and, and uh, retaliation and things like that. Second, most treaties are of indefinite duration. Most contracts are not of indefinite duration. Um, statutes could theoretically be of indefinite duration, but a lot of statutes are amended. What, there's a major difference in treaties in that lots of treaties stay with the same text for a very long period of time, long after the world has changed two or three times. And that makes interpretation really quite different with respect to treaties. Um, third, few treaty disputes are litigated. The contract disputes are litigated all the time. There are treaty disputes that often, for very good reasons, are never formally litigated, which means there's less body of case law built up over time. There are more gaps in general. Excuse me, Paul, what do, do the three characterizations do to the concept of standing in that regard? Well, the concept of standing is a, good, is a very good point as well. Um, you know, standing comes up with all sorts of documents. It's usually not a problem with contracts. It would be whether there is a third party beneficiary or something like that. With statutes, it does come up whether or not the statute was intended to create a private right of action and those so uh, sorts of things. But I think the concept of standing is often um, most difficult, uh, particularly in light of very recent Supreme Court case law with respect to treaties. So what you have with respect to treaties is there could be a flagrant breach of a treaty but there is really no one to, to bring the case, at least to a domestic court, and that maybe is the best result, and that was intended. Um, the, flip, the additional side of that is, remember I said, treaties are not very often litigated, so you don't have a very large and consistent and elaborate case law on interpretation of them, but the additional thing is, it's still true that many, most judges are not familiar with treaties, okay? So they're more prone to error, and Perhaps one of the reasons why for so long U.S. courts have employed analogies is because that's a way of compensating for that. A court stays with a treaty and has to decide a treaty case, and that judge may turn to what they're most familiar with. Um, uh, treaties uh, typically, typically involved uh, uh, often multiple languages, and then perhaps most importantly is there's just a problem of remedy. Remedy. Breaches of contract usually yield satisfactory remedies most of the time, okay? Breaches or problems with statutes, it's up to the legislature to provide or to articulate the remedy. For breaches of treaties, at least in the legal system, there often is no remedy, okay? Or an incomplete or unsatisfactory remedy. And it's, in my view, unwise or impossible to begin, I can't interpret a document or I won't sit there and start interpreting it without my mind racing forward and saying, what's the end game? Yes? Is this because there's no one uh, to enforce it or is it because there's no one to interpret it? Um, it's usually because uh, there's no one to enforce it or the nature of the harm is so pervasive um, that um, the typical remedies we, we have are unsatisfactory for one reason or another. They can't be precise enough, um, or you can't provide injunctive relief. There are limits of judicial power, there are limits of national power. Um, yes? It seems to me that um, you cannot generalize trees as one species, that's it, in uh -huh. terms of the inter interpretive approach. Um, because the nature of the treaty really varies even sure. today, right? And you have uh, certain treaties that are self-executing, such as the UN sales, the sales of goods in 1980. That is treaty, I think, pretty much treaty the same way as statutes, sales, uh, UCC, probably Article 2 uh, in the 
in the sense that it's a state law, but this is sort of like federal sales law, something like that. And that at least in terms of how the, the court interprets it, then uh, you just go ahead and interpret it as, as if like a statutory thing. And then there is multilateral, uh, multilateral treaties, especially norm setting multilateral treaties such as human rights, you know, covenants, etc. Uh, that is totally different. You know, the, 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 the point is, is not really, I don't know to which extent uh, the human rights type of treaties ended up in courts, it seems to be quite a bit. And then there are all kinds of different treaties, uh, both in terms of the, the, the coverage, the purpose, and then the, the, the different, it just, uh, the, the level of details, the intention. And I think it's very hard for me, at least, to comprehend there's only like one, there should be like one approach towards treaty interpretation in the U.S. courts. I think well, it's I very th much depending on the nature of it. Uh, well, I guess I totally agree with you, and this is where that leads me. You know, the point I just made is maybe it's enough with the analogies. Maybe they haven't really, maybe they work for us at one point in time, but they don't work for us ever. So that leads to your question, or if I could rephrase your question, which is, uh, okay, what then? And my answer uh, to that is uh, we need an autonomous body of treaty interpretation law in the United States. Okay, one not dependent on our domestic law. And this goes back to the theme of of my research for a very long time, um, which is rather than approach the international world as we've done in so many other aspects of the law as a, an extension or an adaptation of domestic legal norms, what we need is a body of treaty interpretation law which takes into account that various complexities. So at various times we've done made a half half-hearted attempts to do this, but we've never followed through. So let me briefly answer Julia's question, which is, you know, there is the customary international law uh, of treaty interpretation. Courts for a long time have sometimes uh, referred to it in an opportunistic, not systematic fashion. I'm then sorry, there is... I'm just sorry, it's very quick. I forgot to mention one thing, which is probably along the line of your, what you're saying is, um, what is the Vienna Convention on Law of Treaties? Uh, in terms of its role, uh, of course, U.S. has not adopted, but it right. considered customary international well, law. That was my second. We, okay. we, we looked at the customary international law of treaties, and then there is the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. But our position with respect to it is still kind of ambiguous. I mean, formally, uh, the State Department and various courts have said we view most of the Vienna Convention as a codification of the customary international law of treaties. Um, but you don't know article by article. And there are cases in which we don't seem to follow it, and there are cases in which it clearly applies or would apply, and courts don't refer to it at all. In other words, the Vienna Convention could be the foundation of an American law on treaty interpretation, but we haven't made it so. The last example of that is the third restatement of foreign relations law of the United States. Uh, that incl includes many sections, uh, includes several sections on treaty interpretation, which seem to mirror or draw from the Vienna Convention, but not completely. So here's my last pitch, okay? The, um, um, the American Law Institute is commencing in this year a fourth restatement of the foreign relations law of the United States. And my belief is it should take that opportunity to really explain, clarify, and um, clean house so that we have a clearer, morally fine-tuned um, law regarding treaty interpretations. And we should uh, take this opportunity to leave some of the old baggage behind, which is no longer uh, helpful to us. And so that's the argument I, I that's where I ultimately uh, uh, come out. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I think that maybe your paper explains it. I think it would be, uh, helpful uh, to give examples or maybe some empirical data as to how things done. That would be really helpful. Oh, it would. I just didn't feel like this was a format which I could really. I put think a lot maybe in your paper you addressed those. Okay. Things, sir. Thank you. I have no idea of what type of treaties actually get interpreted by U.S. courts and how that oh, involved yeah. the same type of treaty actually gotten interpreted differently due right. to the historical trend.
I don't know. You know. It's a very, very good question. I am fortunate that some people have already done some of that empirical work for me, and I'll be using some of that. But again, when you use other people's empirical work, somehow they didn't do exactly the work you most need. So I have to figure out what to do about that. John? In, in, in other contexts where courts develop a body of law like through the common law process, they typically do so by reasoning through analogy with uh, other areas where something is better developed. Are you proposing in the development of this new law of treaty interpretation, are you, are you proposing that it, it should be done sort of um, from a vacuum, it would, it would be self-supporting? Uh, if so, that would be, you know, how, how, would, how would courts or the restatement formulators go about doing this other than by looking at how contracts are interpreted and how statutes are interpreted and how administrative regulations are interpreted. Wouldn't it end up being a hybrid uh, based on analogies with other areas? Uh, I don't think so. Um, to, to, to return to what you said earlier, uh, courts use all those analogies, but there's one um, in, in, in torts and criminal law and so forth, but there's one crucial difference. Um, we're not using domestic analogies constantly or international. And crossing a divide in which there's likely to be a problem. And the second answer, uh, the, the second answer I would provide to you is, um, I don't think it need, uh, an American law of free interpretation needs to start with contract interpretation and so forth, because over, over a long period of time, there's a lot of theoretical work on treaty interpretation. There's a large body of international and comparative work on what other countries do, other Anglo countries do, what the Vienna Convention does, and so forth. So I don't think you have to build your whole house on a domestic uh, foundation. Uh, and, that, and why is that important, or why, why I think that's valid? Well, in the case of multilateral treaties, we always have to bear in mind that when the US court interprets that multilateral treaty, foreign courts are going to be doing the same. And there is at least some advantage uh, for there to be some uh, conversation and, and even some consistency rather than to have 59 different interpretations of a same multilateral treaty, which means you don't really have a treaty at all. You ended up with different interpretation anyway. For example, again, sales contract, sales uh, convention, 1980 UN. The same provision will be interpreted by European court and the United States courts, analogous facts, opposite. It's just like, it's very similar situation. So you, we will end it up with different type of interpretation by different treaties, the different courts in different countries. Well, One that's way an, that's an, an interesting topic in which I actually have opinions about. The first is, you know, I like those treaty regimes that have built into them uh, ways of resolving the conflict, eventually. Uh, and that, inclu that in can include um, preliminary ruling hearings, that can include appellate processes, and so forth. But you don't have to wind up with conflicting con uh, treaty interpretations. It's not essential. Uh, Brett? Yeah. It seems to me that you've sort of bur buried the lead here, in, in a way, in, in presenting these issues. Because what's I mean, Sheldon was, I think, kind of onto it here about empire. Uh, it, it seems to me that what's really driving your concern here is the fact that the courts, particularly with respect to, to treaties, that are public law treaties that Im implicate the foreign policy, or in some cases, domestic policy, but sort of, tra tra sort of traditional sovereign authority of the United States, uh, you know, are being interpreted in ways that are convenient to particularly the executive branch, but certainly the political branches of government right. at the expense of the international treaty obligation. And, and, and what has to be confronted here is the political dispute over exactly what role courts should play in this context of, of whether indeed uh, courts should be trying to restrain the political branches of government in consideration of the, the solemn obligation to conform to international legal obligations or whether the role of the courts is to get out of the way uh, and, and allow the political branches of government to conduct the foreign policy uh, and, and other aspects of policy of the United States. Well, it's, I mean, it's a very, very good point. I should have been more open about that, I guess, to put the cards on the table. Uh, my view is um, we need a body of treaty interpretation that is at least less subject to manipulation than what we have now. What we have now is um, you, can, you, know, you can reach into the bag and pull out lots of stuff. 
if you want to, uh, and um, that would be a separate talk why I think that's bad for the country and will be even more bad for the country in the, in the decades ahead, but that's where I come out. Thanks so much for your patience and your very good questions. Last, last thing, what do you think of the title? I wonder whether instead of nothing at all, maybe you want to say sweet generous. Treaty as treaty. Or treaty yeah, as treaty. treaty. Yeah, treaty as treaty. Yeah, treaty as treaty. Ooh, I hadn't thought of that. That's because because treaty. nothing because gives a something. very negative uh, connotation of sound. Oh. Well, yeah. wasn't that the point? Yeah. yeah. That was the original point. Um, I well, to think about that treaty as treaty. Yeah. What you're saying is there is no precise analogy. Right. It is something unto itself. Not only that there's no precise analogy, but in some case, the act of it and analogizing is obfuscating uh, or detrimental in some way, particularly. Well, thank you. That's a very helpful thing. I'll have to think that over. But the, the, the title, as it is, reflects a sense of dissipation, right? I mean, you're going from, 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 from stronger to weaker to nothing. Right. Uh, and, and your political point is, is that. Right. So I, I don't know we want to lose that if that's the point you're trying to make. I gotta think this over. Those are good, very good points. Well, thank you. Then you can add on. Treaty is nothing. Treaty is treaty. Maybe that's the point. Maybe that's the point. Treaty is nothing. Treaty is treaty. Treaty is nothing. 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 Treaty is n